Now I'm going to bring uh, the stage to Chip, and he's going to be guiding us through our final panel of the event, which is going to be talking about the impact of film for both driving solutions and changing minds. Yes. And uh, over to you, Chip. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, <clears throat> everybody. Um, so while we're getting mic'd up, we're going to start to um, roll into our final panel of the R Day 18. Uh, and this will be our film panel with our esteemed film people. And to begin, I would like to screen the new Sizzler Carbon Paradox. Nature has put away carbon over literally hundreds of millions of years, and we suddenly release it. We have overloaded the natural things for carbon. Humans have fundamentally changed the planet, so we better understand what we are doing, otherwise we will suffer the consequences. We cannot solve the climate crisis by just reducing emissions. But we already have dumped so much CO2 in the atmosphere that it's actually too late. By 2009, we had delayed reducing carbon emissions so long, we actually had to take out what was already out there in the atmosphere. There are no other options left on the table. We need ways of getting the CO2 back from the atmosphere. You need a, an agent that will not pick up the oxygen, not pick up the nitrogen, just selectively pick up the CO2. With direct air capture, we mimic trees. But we are much faster and better at this task than a natural tree. So this machine behind us is taking out 50 tons of CO2 per year. And the carb fix process mineralizes that CO2 in less than two years. The CO2 molecule is as important now as petroleum was in the last century. Instead of farming petroleum from the soil, we take the CO2 from the atmosphere. We farm, literally, the sky. Create a product for us that loves carbon and shows that we can solve global warming. Who doesn't want to do that? What we've developed is a technology that takes concentrated greenhouse gas emissions, combine them with air, and turn that into a plastic that can replace plastics made from oil. Now you can grow the economy, create jobs, create exports, and clean the atmosphere of the planet. I see the whole world economy based on carbon now, no petroleum, CO2. So before we get into that <laughs> film, I want to introduce my esteemed panel. And I'd like to start with the lady before gentlemen. So Pat Mitchell, well, hmm, what do you say about Pat Mitchell? We, what I'd like to say is that Pat sits on uh, the board of um, uh, the, the um, participant productions. And participant has become the go-to for all of us documentarians, as, as the studio that you want, I mean, Inconvenient Truth, Syriania, I mean, the list is on, you know, Mal, the Mal, Malala, so many different uh, uh, Oscars. Um, and so not only is she also the chair of the board of the Sundance Institute and many other uh, wonderful things that Pat's accomplished in her life, but let's just talk about uh, for a second, Pat, uh, if you would, uh, before I introduce everybody else, um, the importance of the documentary film 
today and the role that participants playing. Thank you, Chip. Actually, I think these gentlemen could talk about the role of it today because they're still producing films that are changing the way we see the world. The first person that I knew who really believed at the power of media in changing the world, influencing opinion, was Ted Turner. As I said, and believe it or not, in 1990, was producing 400 hours of documentaries about the environment every year. It's kind of hard to imagine. We think so many more are made now. Not true, but there are more ways to get the films out, which is what's so exciting. So when Jeff Skoll started Participant, he, he said, I'm putting $2 billion into this production company. It never has to make a dime. All it has to do is change the world. <laughs> so every film that a participant makes comes with a complete social impact program mm. from the beginning, that's developed from the beginning. Now, they're not all equally successful. Sometimes the film isn't compelling enough. Sometimes a compelling story doesn't get to the right audiences. And then sometimes with an environmental, um, with the, an inconvenient truth, you reach two and a half million people in the world in a matter of six months. Um, and then you know you have started to shape opinions and raise awareness so we can measure that impact. Uh, but not every film hits that mark, but even the ones that don't, every person who sees a compelling story well told, a point well made, like the film we just saw, how can you walk away from seeing truth presented in that way or a new idea or an innovation without being moved to action? And that's the point. And documentaries have throughout our time of telling the truth in that way and showing facts in that way have been able to do that gratefully. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned Ted Turner and he's obviously an idol of mine. In fact, our day, I dare say, wouldn't even be here without Ted. In fact, that's true. When Ted first came, at Sally's invitation in 2008, he put us on the map. And I will mention that he's been back four more times since then. Mm -hmm. So this man is committed, and not only did he create CNN and all of the other things, uh, but, but he also created, I think you told me, the Better World Society it, it, film. It was called the Better World Society because he wanted the films to create a better world. And even though he ran a commercial enterprise, we would have his sponsors drop out of our films. You remember, because you worked for National Geographic in those days. We did a National Geographic film on the uh, end of trees, and we can't remember what it was called, but it was about cutting uh, the original forest. And every sponsor dropped out of it. And Ted said, I don't care, that's not the point. How many people are gonna watch it? And that legacy continues gratefully in the work of documentary filmmakers like these, in the work of the films that come to the Sundance Festival, um, Chasing Coral, Chasing Ice, um, uh, so many of them that every year come to the festival. Right. They're more made now perhaps than ever before and they're better made in many ways because they have so much more technology and ways to tell stories as right. we just witnessed. Well, you know, thank you, Mr. Turner, and, and thank you, um, Ms. Mitchell, um, for your great work. This, is, this woman has produced more documentary films than any woman in the United States of America. Well, I'm not sure about that, Chip, but I appreciate <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure about that. I, I, mean, I researched I, that statistic. You know, statistic. I've already presented myself as an elder, so we don't have to go okay. into all that. Well, when you were at CNN, <laughs> I remember you ran that unit. Okay, yeah, so yeah. Um, let's move on to the board. We'll move on. So um, I'd like to go right to the man who, uh, the artist who uh, we just saw his his uh, sizzle reel on something called par Carbon Paradox. It came out of something called Carbon Negative. And Paul Atkins, uh, you've had an extraordinary career. I know that you've worked with um, luminaries like Terrence Malick. You were the second unit director on Master wow. Commander, I believe. Wow. Um, so many different documentaries for uh, PBS, uh, uh, Nova, I think, and, 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 and many others. So. Um, can you talk a little bit about the importance of visual narrative? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, interesting thing about documentary films, and I came from a science background. I thought I was going to be a marine biologist, and then I trained myself to shoot with underwater cameras, and then I realized uh, I didn't want to be a scientist. I wanted to be a filmmaker, a storyteller. So I got in through the scientific side of things and got into documentaries, and it, 
I had to learn an important lesson, and is that the documentary films, in spite of our you know emotions, uh, in spite of our our preconceptions about them, are not really about education and not really about information. It's about appealing to the emotions and appealing to the mind through the emotions, and that's why you know. Um, Often how you portray a subject or something is more important than the facts about that subject. I often talk about, like, I did a lot of films. I was fascinated by sharks for years. And, um, you know, or why, you know, are sharks really dangerous? And, and I can throw out the, the statistic which blows everybody's mind. Um, every year on this planet, sharks kill, on, on average, fluctuates a little bit, but on average, five people a year. Mm. Humans kill, every year on the planet, 70 million sharks. Wow. That, that's a true story. Now, why are we so afraid of sharks? <laughs> and it really goes back to how they're portrayed. When we lure them with baits, and we shove the uh, camera in their mouths, and we get that jaws shot, and you miss seeing the poetry and the beautiful uh, uh, hydrodynamics of that animal. Um, so, uh, and uh, you know, we've all been guilty of that. It's like living in Hawaii. I have people come to Hawaii all the time, producers who want to film, and they're blown away that there's rain <laughs> and that there are clouds and that there's bad weather because every time we film Hawaii, we wait for the sun to clear. And we take these shots and we make sure telephone poles aren't in the shots. <laughs> and, and, and in that way, it's the portrayal of the place. Anyway. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Well, you know, um, so to the point of the uh, film that we just watched, um, we've been talking about producing a feature documentary because this is the, the film that <clears throat> the world needs to see. And, and just a quick backstory, um, you know, I had an idea, concept for a film called Now, go figure, I love that word. And, um, you know, and, and Paul and I and Patrick and we all came together and it turned a, a direction and we went to, uh, Paul took a crew to Abu Dhabi and began a production, production of a film called Carbon Negative, which really is a beautiful Graciela Chilchininsky um, uh, uh, story about how we can transform our world economies and pull the carbon out of the atmosphere, sequester it into the earth. And I think that that's really the only story that really needs to be told, quite frankly, at this point in our collective evolution. Um, Paul, can you just talk a little bit before we turn to the rest of our STEAM panel, um, you know, a little bit about, you know, how you see that film playing out? Mm -hmm. Well, as you said, the idea f uh, for it came from the short film that we did uh, about one carbon capture technology and, and Graziella and her extraordinary philosophy. And it opened my eyes to something which I was not aware of. I've been, uh, you know, an environmentalist for years, making films for years, aware of all sorts of sustainable energies. I was not aware that the technology existed to extract CO2 from the atmosphere and that it was possible to envision a new economy based on products made from that, based on sequestering that CO2 and rebalancing the carbon cycle, making fuels, all the things that actually, if you've you know, been at this conference, you've, you've heard people talk about. And um, when I would uh, discuss this with friends of mine, educated friends of mine, like outside of you know, uh, our, our circle, we, we might be aware of, of carbon removal or carbon capture, but in the world at large, zero awareness. Zero awareness that it is even possible. And it's fascinating to me because um, I just came from a conference in Jackson Hole, the Carbon Capture Coalition Conference. And there, the discussion was all about not whether carbon capture was possible, but how, exactly how are we going to do it. Various technologies were presented that already exist, prototype technologies. Some of them are operating now and accomplishing that. And then uh, it's very interesting coming here after that. Um, by the way, thanks for inviting me here because I'm in the middle of researching uh, this feature film. So uh, what an experience uh, being here and, and meeting so many of you and getting all of these ideas for the film. But one thing I did notice is is that there still is a perception that uh, the technology is not possible, mm -hmm. that it's too expensive, mm -hmm. that it's unproven, that it doesn't exist, and we shouldn't rely on it. And yet, if we heard Klaus Lochner today, basically the climate math says we have to employ it at some stage. So 
it blows my mind, th this idea, and also the idea of that we can do this and, cre and create a new economy is a right. vision that's not doom and gloom. It's a vision that get, it inspires us. I'm not going to use hope anymore because of the last talk we heard, but it empowers us right. to do something. Well, and for the record, uh, the worldwide uh, carbon economy that now exists is about 200 billion, and I think most of that is enhanced oil recovery, which is out of the fossil industry. But uh, we do have air capture now uh, tax credits through uh, something called 45Q that was passed in Trump's budget bill. And Senator Whitehouse was able to attach a rider onto that. Mm -hmm. That actually brings the cost down for direct air capture, according to who you talk to, but Graciela says it can go as low as $15 a ton. Now, you have to have a tax appetite to you know, utilize a tax credit, but the point is that these markets are already here. We know that we have you know, bubbles in your Coca-Cola, uh, you know, carbon fibers in your uh, automobiles for your shifters and your body parts and so forth. Many, many ways to do this. And um, you know, with a worldwide economy uh, that's about uh, 80 trillion a year based on the extraction and burning of fossil fuels, to think that we have to now take that and reverse it, and now that economy has to be based on the rapid implementation of renewable, sustainable, and energy efficient <laughs> technologies, and while simultaneously taking out 1,000 gigatons, which is a, a, a trillion tons of carbon and sequestering it down into the back into the ground. Okay, so mm -hmm. has anybody ever heard of the myth <laughs> called Pandora? <laughs> okay, or Rumpelstiltskin? Okay, but we can do this, folks. We know we can do this. Humans well, like to rise to a challenge. Mm -hmm. This is what we're presenting ourselves with at this point in time. So, um, well, just to finish, if I, if I can just finish please. answering what, what that sizzle reel is about. So, we, uh, uh, we, you know, we decided that this is a bigger story than the one short. There's a lot of technologies. There's also the whole carbon cycle, the natural history of it to consider. Because once you go back into the history of Earth and you understand the cycling of carbon, you realize what our problem is. And the solution is rebalancing it, you know. So um, that was Sizzle Reel was for a 90-minute feature documentary that we're now developing and writing and researching. And uh, we mean it to uh, be in the theaters to create an event out of it and then beyond that have an outreach program with a website and other videos that allow you to go in more detail into each topic. And we really want to change public awareness on this and we're in the middle of developing it and, uh, and seeking fundraising for it. Great. Well, uh, thanks. Now that we've got that on the table, I want to turn to James Baylog. You know, you're an extraordinary gentleman who I happened to run into while we were freezing in line waiting to get into the Bella Center at COP15 in Copenhagen uh, when they shut us out that day. We finally made it in, um, frozen <laughs> to the, I think you actually might have gone back to the hotel at that point. But you were in the middle of a <laughs> film called Chasing Ice, which really did change the world in terms of this conversation about carbon and the smoking gun. Can you bring us up to speed on what's happened since then? Oof, well, <clears throat> I don't have hours to talk about it, but the, the short story is that Chasing Ice had fantastic uh, outreach uh, internationally. Uh, we screened it at the White House. We screened it at the UN numerous times, um, at the US Congress. Uh, House of Commons in the UK, and on and on and on. Um, we had a tremendous amount of interest on social media in some of the imagery we had uh, produced. As I said last night, I think uh, one of those uh, clips of a, of a collapsing glacier has been seen well over 40 million times on YouTube. Um, and it's, but aside from those details, I mean, it, it's clear that the film has, um, cemented the issue of climate change altering the world as being something that's clearly understood and unmistakable. And, and it happened because of exactly my original intentions with the Extreme Ice Survey, which was really the underlying project that the film was made about. My intention was that in the ice, even though it's far away, it is a three-dimensional real-time manifestation of something happening. And a lot of this climate change stuff, you simply can't see it. So the pictures brought that reality alive. Mm -hmm. And boom, boom, it created a, a wave of understanding that hadn't been there before. And that I think it, it's critical to understand here because we've, you know, a lot of the conversations the past few days have been into some deep psychology 
and uh, philosophy and emotional things. And all of that's vitally important. There, everything we're talking about is just a piece of the puzzle. There's no one silver bullet. There's no one magic solution. So what we bring to the party is one of those pieces of what has to happen. And my particular bias is to say, OK, through the integration of art and science, we can create a, uh, we can reveal, we can create a revelation about what's going on. But what we've been talking about, especially today, is that if art and science reveals, it's heart and soul that will resolve. Mm. So heart and soul have to resolve this. That's what Manu was talking about. Yeah. And so through the visual arts, we have the opportunity of creating something that then also doesn't just reveal art and science, it triggers a response from the human heart and soul through the human stories we tell. And that's what ultimately, I hope, uh, you know, people like us can contribute to this, uh, this issue. And translates to direct action, which we've been calling for for four days. I mean, this is the final day of the R Day Sundance on June 21st. I want to have everybody <laughs> take note of that. This is the real Sunday, the longest day of the year, the high holy day recognized by every indigenous group around the world, not to mention you know, the rest of us that aren't quite as evolved. <laughs> um, so, uh, Greg, can we just talk quickly about your um, uh, uh, movie called uh, Fields of Fuel? Uh, you invited me to come to Sundance uh -huh. when it was um, a screening there. I remember um, making a prediction that you were going to win the Audience Award, and I happened to uh, win the lottery that day. <laughs> did. And, um, story. Um, and then you changed it to a movie, uh, you changed the name to Fuel. I did. And you picked up the story from there. Sure. Well, I think I'll, I'll share a little bit why we changed the name, um, which really hasn't been really revealed ever about that story when we won Sundance, and we were there, and we won the Audience Award. And, um, Actually, the joke was uh, on Tuesday, The Hollywood Reporter um, did the review, and we got the worst review you could ever get. And my partner at the time, Josh DeKell, was just demoralized as the director. He had spent like eight years or 10 years of his life. And you know, basically, if you're, you get a bad review, your film is gonna, pretty much going to die. And Chip was in our condo at the time. And, and I said, don't worry about it. I said, everyone loves the film. We're going to win the audience award. And Chip's like, yeah, sure. He's like, I'm betting on that. And we ended up winning. <laughs> and uh, it was a game changer. <laughs> and the funny thing about that story is no one, if you go online, you Google it, no one remembers the review of The Hollywood Reporter. <laughs> what they do remember is us going to Dallas, Texas, winning that award, going to Sedona, winning that. I mean, it was all just, but it was, it was even more deeper than that. And being at our day, I'll, I'll share a little bit more about that story, um, was when we were in DC, I don't know if you were there, Sharon, or not, but all of a sudden there were all these bad reviews coming out about our movie. And Josh was like, how could this happen? And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, no one can see our movie. How could they be saying bad things about our movie when we haven't released it yet? And at that moment in time, we had realized that there were external forces that didn't want this message to come out into the world. Right, and so. And so it really drove, actually, I'm just, let me just finish. It really drove Josh to actually, which we should, I mean, looking back now and really understanding what, what was occurring with the oil industry and um, being inside there and the campaign that went out, there's a whole thing about time about, um, I think, we're, how could we you know, make fuel and people were starving and the whole idea of poverty. And um, you know, Josh went off to like, make it a solution film, which is really how it changed, it transformed. This is during the time that biofuels were yeah. becoming, you know, diesel engines were running off of McDonald's. So also 2008 when the market crashed, which we didn't know. But just to come back about what we should have done is we should have gone and taken that story to CNN. And we mm -hmm. should have broke the news. Mm -hmm. And we didn't. Which, looking back now, I think, you know, in, in retrospect, mm -hmm. and seeing the power of that particular film and what was needed. And we still ended up, we were very, we were very fortuitous. We got a lot of money um, from um, Paul DeJora, um, you know, like millions of dollars to put that film out. And 
I can understand everyone thinks that Toyota was the greatest car. I, I don't know if I agree with that. I know that women, particularly, when they saw that film, they would go out, sell their SUVs, and buy a hybrid. And we saw that in every state around the country. So let's bump it so forward. We're talking about direct action, just going back to your point. Well, let's, I mean, look, you, I'm taking a little trip down yeah, memory lane. Just sharing here. memories. This is 10 years ago, yeah. okay? This is like, you know, COP 15, 2009 Copenhagen. This is 2008 Sundance. And the point is that that's 10 years ago from right now. And, and so just remember, it's not that long ago. And look at how different the world was then in terms of the renewable energy movement. Now, your next movie was called Rooted in Peace. And I want to give you a huge compliment here, the best Ted Turner interview that I've ever seen. Thank you. He was extraordinary in that. Now, I know others in the room might not agree, but I thought it was a really good one. So um, it was OK. So let's just talk about, let's talk about peace as a component of solution to the biggest existential crisis facing humanity, which is the collapse of the biosphere, biosphere due to the burning of excessive fossil fuel. Rooted in Peace, that movie um, didn't have quite the probably uh, well, reach that Fuel it's, had. It's but. still going. I mean, it's interesting we talk about that film and even Fuel, they still go. I mean, they still play. I mean, the thing that's interesting even about Fuel, even three years after, we got picked up by Hulu. And we ended up having a great run after that. And I think the thing about Rooted in Peace, it's, you know, we met through EarthX. I think we might be going to Mexico and showing it in Spanish. And it's now out, you know, I mean, I think that... I think we showed it at our day like three times. <laughs> yeah. Three different years. Yeah, I mean, I think that when you make... I think the, the, the concept which we all hope to achieve is having the evergreen film, mm -hmm. where these films continue to play and, the, and their messages resonate and, you know, and, and they're, they're, you know, they're, they're done in a unique way, like you were alluding to about Chasing Ice. It's a film that we need to continue to see. It's an evergreen, and it reminds us of our truce, you know, which is really what the, which is what this is about. It's like this is really happening, and as storytellers, how do we tell that story? I mean, in Rooted in Peace, I was just, for me, it was more about 9-11, my home, New York, going through JFK Airport, and I could no longer drink water anymore, and almost getting arrested for not giving up my water. And that propelled me to make that film. Um, you know, I mean, I think it's an important film. I think that, you know, we now live in a very, you know, violent country, you know, and we talk about peace and, and you know, and the environmental movement and environmental justice and how we're going to transform this and how it needs to be done with love and tenderness, but there's a problem going on and, and whether it's up in the sky with the carbon or how we relate socially, um, but I think as storytellers, you know, we're bringing that, that message forward. Great. Um, Michael Caine, now you are an extraordinary gentleman. I only met you a few years ago, but I understand that you not only founded the uh, Dallas International Film Festival and Earth X uh, Films, but you're also an accomplished documentary filmmaker in your own right. Yeah. I'm, I'm lucky. I, um, I, I'm, uh, great stories tend to come my way. I mean, you brought um, Race and Extinction to us, and I think that I started the Deep Ellum Film Festival in 99 to raise money for cancer relief, and my father had cancer. And when you start something like that and you get to meet the filmmakers and the storytellers and you get to connect it with a cause, it becomes very addictive. And you really, you, you love that moment of being able to, right before it goes dark, knowing that you know what that audience is about to experience. And the, the fact that you're able to support these creative storytellers and to be a part of their journey. I was going to ask just for a second, could any of the filmmakers who are in the audience raise their hand? Can we all give them a standing? Yeah. Okay. Can we all stand up? <laughs> I, I can't stand. Wow. That's a lot. Look at that. Amazing. It's just so important, and it, and it you know, at the moment when we finally see a film, there, there's such a long process. They used to say it was seven years from the time, I think it's longer many times, from the time that an idea comes up to getting the funding, which is so complicated and difficult, and then the, the production, what it takes to actually fly places and do things, and then finally to get the film ready, and then that's when the hard part starts. 
because that's when actually it's how do you get it in front of an audience and how do you get it in front of the right audience? How do you get it in front of the people that you're wanting to change their hearts and minds? And I, like I said, I, I've always been blessed from, I made a film that went to Sundance years ago, TV Junkie, that won the special jury prize and HBO picked it up about addiction and I didn't shoot a frame of it. The man delivered 3,000 hours of footage to us and said, do something with this. And uh, a year later, no, no, actually, sorry, six years later, we found somebody who would fund it, and one year later, we had a movie at Sundance. So I've always really appreciated the journey that filmmakers have to go through. Uh, Trammell Crow is the co-founder of uh, EarthX Film, and um, you know, I don't know, how many of you have been to EarthX yet? or Earth Day Texas, or Earth Day Dallas, or you know, any of the names. Do you all have a marble? <laughs> if you don't have a marble, you haven't, uh, we'll take care of that. <laughs> but uh, you know, film was something that years ago, we realized that there was this thing that we could add to EarthX that would magnify everything else that was going on. Is that slide actually up? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, great, I wasn't sure, but that's actually, um, we had two opening nights. One of them was uh, James Balog's great film, The Human Element, which played last night, and I know is playing again over the weekend. Uh, and this is uh, the opening night for The Game Changers, Louis Sihoyas' mm -hmm. film on uh, vegan athletes. And who would imagine that you would sell out a venue about vegans? Yeah. Um, so this was us finding a crowd, finding a crowd for that story, and for those filmmakers, and I'm gonna do just a few slides, and then I'll actually I want to show you something. How I big think is that theater? 450 seats. Mm, wow, it's completely sold so, out. Yeah, that was great. Awesome. It was the, you know, and, and a very diverse crowd. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I love about film is that, you know, it's for everyone. It's the it's the gateway to the arts in many ways, and storytellers. You know, story matters. It's so important. Uh, and it's such a long journey to be able to deliver this is always what you want for a filmmaker. Um, to, to show up to James's film, which we opened up, he came two weekends in a row, which we were very blessed, and to show up in that first night to have to actually ask two of our employees to get up out of seats so that we could uh, let people who had paid for tickets sit there, but you know, sold out. That was just fantastic mm. for a movie that they just put trust in us that it must be good and trust because they have an idea what he does. There you go, there's, there's Jim, Jim there with his poster. <laughs> but our festival, it's film, it's interactive, it's art, it's music, it's education. All those are important pieces of the journey that we're providing for people. Um, you know, 137,000 people attended EarthX this last year. 9,800 of those were film. Um, 3,000 of those were K-12 students, and that's a big part of where we really see working toward the future. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, filmmakers, 17 countries, uh, we had a gala, which will come up in a minute, um, 40 features, 36 virtual realities, <laughs> booths, Trammell, it's very important, booths <laughs> is in there, if anyone knows Trammell. Uh, we did in-school screenings, and there's a magic moment when you show a film and you see a group of school kids just being blown away. Mm -hmm. Just you know that their lives are changed mm -hmm. and that we're getting them early and we're, we're it's like um, you know, the, the Terminator, we're getting them before the event happens. So we're sort of going back before Sarah Connor. But you know, that's what film can do when you get them young. Um, this is from the gala, so you get an idea. The interesting thing about this, notice the male-female ratio, 65% female and 35% male of uh, the people who come to our website, which once again tells you who we're advertising to. <laughs> the, um, you know, it's, it's important to us to show the coverage that we got this year was just so much more than we expected. Um, Trammell being on CNN International, which was, you know, we couldn't get the media to cover the event for a long time. Oh, yeah. They really, you know, it was like film opened up the pathway for them to be able to go okay, now I get this EarthX, I get the yeah. context to it. And, and I think that's sort of one of the thing I'm really proud of what we've been able to provide. Um, you know, this is someone from the opening weekend. Uh, you know, it's always good to have a Nutria come in, we find is really important. But we brought the film festival to the people. It wasn't just in Fair Park as a part of EarthX, but it was in the Arts District. And that is a large rat there. David Holbrook is our artistic director, if any of you know him. 
came from Telluride Mountain Film, and I just think he has a gift. Um, uh, you know, to watch him interview, it's always good to have an owl that will always work. <laughs> <laughs> Any bird will work. Um, albatrosses. Um, you know, Wolves it, are good too. Yeah, outdoor screenings, but I'll that. move off in a moment because it's always also good to have someone um, from another country sing unexpectedly before your film. The, um, you know, we just had dynamic films that afterwards I've had at least 10 people come up after the Game Changer saying I'm vegan now. Wow. I haven't had yeah. meat since yeah. that Our night. Our children. And that's what you want. Yeah, yeah. that's social action. Yeah. Our children have it. Can, can I just ask Michael a question? Please. Uh, the, how many documentaries are submitted for uh, being shown at the festival each year? Um, between sh submitted and ones that we track, over 500. Yeah. Um, and you have how many spaces? And you know, and, well, and if you include all the screenings we do, because the different ones, it's about 99 screenings. There's also a 3D component that we do that we show these nature 3D films, and right. so they screen more than once. But you know, that's part of it. it. It's there's great. We're looking for great storytellers. We're looking for people who can change hearts and minds. Yeah. And uh, that's like Kate Brooks who's sitting over there in her film. You know, these are yeah. The, yeah. They change the way you are forever. You're yeah. never the same. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually move to a clip. By the way, goat yoga is also always another good thing to do. <laughs> um, but I'll come back to this live music with the score, uh, you know, award winners, and obviously, uh, you know, mm -hmm. great to have James and his film because that's the film that we're getting behind for the future. That's a film that we want to be supportive of in its journey post this. That's Do you so think important. we could actually yeah. throw up that next really? video clip? Because I think it'll give you a better idea of why we get so excited about the festival. And I apologize, I think I'm taking up the entire thing. And Chip will then get on to me later and I'll be embarrassed. <laughs> so um, <laughs> let's see if. There it is. And by the way, it is 95 seconds. It's okay. <laughs> We're the ground zero of climate change. We've had cyclones, we've had severe flooding, but through it all, people find a way to survive. Those are all from films that we, we screened and just clips from some of them that we did. But, you know, that's exciting. That's the, you, you get people, you can talk to them, but you, you let them see that and it connects, I think, to their hearts and soul. And that's really what we look to do. And virtual reality is a big piece of this, I think, for the future too. And everyone's sort of finding its place in this. But right. there's so many different ways to connect. And I want to make a point here for those in the audience that might not know, but documentary films don't make money. I mean, like 10 of them they have or something. Know. You know, Al Gore's made, you know, 30 million. And I think uh, Fahrenheit 9-11 has the top box office at 120 million. Or, and the timing, and uh, you know, there's a lot of things that um, Michael Moore made that one. Um, that, but, but most, by and large, documentaries um, are, are not commercially successful. And so they have to be made through, uh, you know, foundation grants and philanthropy and, um, you know, by and large. And so I just want to take my, you know, 
tip of the hat to the documentary filmmaker yeah. that really has to tough it out. This is, this is not the, the Hollywood image that many people might, yeah. might enjoy. Yeah, I'll yeah. show you how films get done. You see these little... Time to recover. Got to have a lot of those. <laughs> right. and Deep dead. The, the reason I asked Michael about how many, and it was to honor the filmmakers, which I really appreciate you honoring the storytellers in the room, is there are so many made every year, and it used to be heartbreaking to have 12,000, and we did one year have 12,000 documentaries submitted for less than 30 spaces at the Sundance Festival. Mm -hmm. And we tracked it, and we found that out of all the ones that did play, less than 100 actually got seen outside of festivals, and then less than 10 were seen by more than one million people. But that's, the good news is, that was 10 years ago. And like you say, so much changes in 10 years. And now we've got so many other distributors and so many other ways for artists themselves, storytellers themselves, to market and get their films out. And then so many more great festivals like the one you've created. Um, right, Netflix, you know, the, Hulu, all of these are vehicles. All the, the options that filmmakers have now, the storytellers have, it's still not going to make money except in rare instances. That's true. But then we're not, I don't think any of us has ever been in that business to make so I'm, money. So I'm, I'm kind of curious because some documentaries do make money. And when you say documentaries don't make money, it means they, they don't make the millions, you know, that feature films, that, that narrative films make. Yeah. But um, I'm, I'm curious about participant media. When you go in, you guys go in and make a decision about what film you're going to make a support. You're looking to make money, yes. I mean, no. not, not a lot of it. No, you're not. You're looking to do good. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that, to make change. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. the mandate. At, mm -hmm. uh, just, that's not to say that films that have been made haven't made money. Sure. They have. Yeah. But the expense of running an operation that has 100 people in social impact. Um, right. So, it, you know, the money goes back into the company. It's yeah. a not-for-profit uh, production. That's, that's I think it's terrific. critical to recognize that there's a profound quixotic character to this. You know, we're all yeah. Don Quixote with our young Sancho Panzas, Panzas behind us, tilting at windmills. Yeah. And the reason is that we're all idealists and we're all crazy in our own obsessive compulsive <laughs> ways. Mm -hmm. And you that's realize that, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, the stories that we tell are a way, not the only way, but it's one of the critical ways that societies and uh, political bodies, communities, will see themselves differently. And that's what the human race has always done. There's some kind of philosophy that floats around above and outside the quotidian nonsense of, of uh, ordinary life. And then there's some philosopher sitting in a castle somewhere who tells a new story. Mm. And in, a, in our modern societies, that's what we're doing. We're trying to tell the new stories. And hopefully those new, new impulses get embedded in the, in the culture and the society, and we can shift the arc of history. Yeah. It's true. It seems that the documentary film has really come into its own in the last 10, mm -hmm. 20 years. Uh, you know, whereas before, if the feature narrative of, say, what created, uh, you know, the, the, well, the golden age of <laughs> film, the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, that then led into the television and finally, you know, we end up in the, in the modern age where we're all watching, you know, our, our movies on our iPhones. And, um, and as Steve Michelson pointed out, if you want to play to the millennials, you know, you've got 60 seconds because that's all they're going to give you, you know, whether, you know, swiping left or right or however that works. So, uh, <laughs> um, so in the last remaining uh, minutes here, and, and before we do that, I want to get to the shameless plug that Impact Film, actually that we've screened Monday and, and last night with uh, uh, Jim's movie, but is going to move across the street to our, uh, we'll set up the town hall as a, as a film screening room, and that begins tomorrow, and we'll have films uh, from 10 to uh, 5 each day. So any, human element at 10. And the human element is at 10, Great. and uh, James has agreed to come and, and speak afterwards. So anybody who missed it, uh, please come and see it there. Um, and they're free. So um, maybe we could just uh, conclude this panel with each filmmaker's remarks and observations about what it means to now go forward with films that 
actually can change the world, and now we know what changes are necessary. And the human element would be a great place to start. Oh, boy. Um, the change that I see is still being necessary is a change in perception. And again, that's my own bias. That's the angle I come at. Yes, we need new technology, and we need uh, new politics, we need new finance, whatever. There's a thousand things we need, but in my world, the thing I can, I can touch, the windmill that I can tilt against is perception. Um, there's, a, there's an expression in the Eastern religious traditions that there's this, this maya, M-A-Y-A, that surrounds us. It's this veil of illusion that, that prevents us from really seeing the world clearly and intensely. And what I'd like to do in my own little way is peel off just a, another crack, you know, peel off the curtain of maya a little bit so we can peer around the curtain a little bit more and see past the veil of illusions to what's important. Hmm. Michael? Um, I think if I were going to give people advice sort of under what you're saying, the, there's three kinds of return on investment. There's, most people think of dollar on dollar, internal rate of return. Somebody gives you a dollar, you get a dollar plus back. Or in, the, in filmmakers, you get 2% back on the, <laughs> the money gift. There's also the external and the eternal rates of return. And there's the external means the good that you do around you, the changes that you make, the nonprofits that you help, the causes that need to be affected, the, the ones who have a mission who can use film and media to help them get there. Mm. Uh, and then the eternal is the actual impact and good that we do beyond all the process. Ooh, I like that. And, and I would ask people mm -hmm. to one, be supportive of this process for filmmakers, for storytellers. Mm -hmm. I'd ask for nonprofits to connect with filmmakers, for content creators and holders to look for, we know that film and media works. We know that it can touch people. So have conversations with these storytellers and ask them to get on your team and get on their team. Mm. Help them make a difference because together with these new forms of distribution we have, an exhibition, you know, we all have to get behind it to make the difference that we can make. Beautiful. And Pat? Mm. This, these are so beautiful. Can you just remind me what you said a moment ago about <laughs> art and science? Oh, that art and science. We need to write this down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so We're recording that. it all. It's being live. Oh, this actually came to me when I was driving to Telluride Mountain Film a few weeks ago. I was driving past the uh, San Juan Range, and it, that, that phrase just kind of popped into my head, and I wrote it on, on a Post-it note, that art and science uh, reveal and heart and soul resolve. Ah. Mm. Just love that. Yeah. I was going to wow. go very yeah. boldly Eternal. somewhere in my house. Because when I was thinking, listening to all of us and knowing how many storytellers are in this room, I, I really wish I were making films now and telling stories. I, I mean, I will always tell stories. But because I do think there's so many other ways that we have to do that, to bring art and science together innovation, technology. It's given us all kinds of ways to tell stories that we didn't have before. And the good news about that is that the cost of doing it has also gone down as the technology has gotten mm -hmm. better. So for storytellers, there are more tools at their disposal, more interesting and innovative ways to tell stories. And in reaching across the generations, which we've all talked about and feel strongly about, we have to recognize that we are dealing with a generation that is consuming and, and taking stories in in a different way. At the festival, we found short films are by far the most popular now. We know that on Netflix and Hulu and all the other places, that we, that's just a reality of the way we're consuming stories. But we have more important stories. The, the time is now for the ones that remind us uh, we don't have a lot of time to waste on stories that don't make a difference, that don't, yeah. cre that don't create change, mm -hmm. that don't make the world better. And um, I'm happy to know there's so many people in this room and that this extraordinary panel are still doing that. 
Thank you. Yeah. Paul. I, I would, uh, the first thought was uh, just a second what Jim said about perception. I think that's the most important thing. Uh, even the film that we're making now, I don't see it as about technology. I see it about the re-imaging, uh, re uh, uh, the public perception of this carbon. It's not a lump of coal. But mm -hmm. you know what's really on my mind right now, and I'm thinking about it a lot going back to documentary films and, and doing this film is how polarized we are, yeah. how polarized the world is, and how uh, there's just screaming and yelling from, from left and right, from one extreme to the other. And I, I, I just think that in, uh, perceptually we need to try and, and bridge the extremes and say this is our common interest in, in the center and your side has a point, your side has a point and try and tell stories which bring us together. Um, you know, I mean, just to go, go back to uh, climate change, that's an extremely divisive word, you know, it divides us into camps. We need to sort of reframe that idea. And I, then I think when you, I, I mean, when I'm discussing this film w with um, Republican conservatives, you know, um, I, if I say we can clean the environment and make money at the same time, I know it's a catchphrase. They go, I'm on board. I want to hear this, you know. So mm -hmm. I think we, uh, to summarize, I think <clears throat> we have to be careful in documentary filmmaking because we're so passionate and we live in a bubble to avoid preaching to the converted. Yeah. I think we got it. Great. Okay, Greg, well, you're going to get the final uh, film panel comment before we close. Sure. Um, well, one, amazing. Um, panel and just honored to be here. Um, for me, I think the the thing that's really come to mind in the last six months is this concept called like the moral imperative and uh, the compass of life and what's driving us to make change. And it's sort of really it's a morality and ethics issue that we're sort of you know grappling with right now. And I think as a storyteller, you know, and being able to illuminate and to bring, to bring these truths forward, I think for me is the, the, insp the inspirational moment. Because when I think about like having to make another documentary and just that process, you know, it, it's a, you know, when you pull out your credit card, it's funny because <laughs> we're showing my first film, Hollywood's Magical Island, Catalina, which Pat, I don't know if you remember, helped. It got on, it went on every PBS station across yep. North America. It was about the Wrigley family and who was like one of the first pi environmental pioneers. And I financed that, that film on my credit cards. You know, and, and thank God they were all paid off and I still make money on that film. And I, I, I ask why? What is it about that particular man and that particular piece of history? What was it I was so compelled to do this film and I was an underwater photographer and that's, those are my roots. And so when I think about like telling story, you know, it's gotta come really at like at the soul level. It's got, you really have to just really care and I think that's really what we're all, we're all caretakers and we really love our planet and we just want everyone to really just appreciate what we have. And th these visual images that we can bring forth with music and, and poetry, it's just, it's just, this is what it's about really. And the more that we can continue to do it and the more that we can see the change because D Diana, Dina, Diana Cohen, when she said, she's like, why do I do this? And we saw this 15-year-old, you know, Hannah, this social change agent. I mean, she was taking videos, 30 seconds, and showing it to her principal. And you could see that change and bringing it into the schools and the removal of plastic. And, you know, that's, that's the ultimate. That's what, we're, that's what we're trying to do. We're just trying to make us a better place so that tomorrow, you know, we can look back and say, yeah, we made a difference. Yeah, we did it. <laughs> Great. Well, with nine seconds left, I have to hand it to you all for your wonderful work uh, over the years. Uh, we look forward to seeing your next films, and thank you so much for joining us at the Yard Day. Thank you. Thank you.